Thank you. 
Uh, 
Thank you and welcome everyone to the Siegel Center. We're here to celebrate Mahad Salaiha, uh, particularly the, with the publication of her five volume collection of her theater criticism. Um, I'm gonna just briefly introduce the speakers and then we're gonna start with a short video that was recorded by Marvin Carlson who can't be here today, he's out of the country. So uh, immediately to my right, is my dear friend, Sarah Fahmi. Sarah is a assistant professor of theater and performance research at Florida State University. Um, she's been hugely instrumental in developing uh, institutional support for research in theater of the MENA region through some of the principal research organizations in the US. So for most notably, she was a co-founder and continuing director of the Middle Eastern focus Middle Eastern Focus Group. I'm sorry, the Middle Eastern <laughs> Focus Group at ATHA, which is the largest theater organ academic theater organization in the U.S., and she's super active in a lot of others. Her own research focuses on uh, main specific decolonialist feminist praxis with young women, and that draws upon your lived experience. I understand that you're writing about work that sometimes you you've been engaged in. Um, and it's very exciting work, and we're all, you know, we're all waiting for the for the book. Um, I'm also here with Adam Oseg. So this is Adam Cairo born, grew up in Dubai, but uh, this is also a kind of homecoming for yes. for Adam. Adam pursued PhD studies right here at CUNY. Yes, he yes. got his MFA at um, at, at Brooklyn. Yes. So this is his neighborhood. Um, I. Uh, had the privilege as a teacher of getting a chance to read one of his first, an early draft of one of his first plays, which was brilliant. Don't then, remind me of that. <laughs> which was brilliant then, and then went on to perform for performances in San Francisco. At, yes. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a professional perform production at uh, Sil uh, Golden Thread. Yes. Yeah. Which I unfortunately didn't get a chance to see, but the reviews were amazing. I could talk about a lot of his work, but but I just saw uh, this uh, reading of the first part of Allah, a family trilogy, which is this uh, going to be an amazing piece about the Egyptian activist, Allah Abdel Fattah. And what's so amazing is that, that it draws heavily from his writings, from testimonies. Adam and his dramaturg spent months interviewing the family. But it's also about the ethical dilemma of representing the activist. Um, it's about the ethical dilemma of making art from testimonies. And the work itself blurs the boundaries between testimony and the real, that the, the characters commenting on the, pract uh, the, the, the dilemma of being characters in a play. Um, and But oddly enough, it feels like this is text taken from actual conversations. So, they are both characters commenting on themselves as characters, but using the language that was generated during the interviews. It's, I mean, it's going to be amazing. And so we're all just in urging him to make it what he's kind of like, oh, no one's going to go see a three part, four hour play. We're all like, they will if it's this good. So um, I'm super excited about that. I'm super excited to hear what all these folks have to say about Nahab Saleh. I, I love her criticism, but they have a very different lived experience with her criticism. Um, and we're going to get right into it. But before you hear from us, you get the privilege of hearing from Marvin. So I'll turn this off and join you in the audience. And if I could ask you guys to queue up Marvin's talk, uh, comments. Kitad. Delighted to be able to Hello, everyone. I, I'm delighted to be able to communicate with you by Zoom. I'm extremely sorry I can't be there physically, uh, but I'm in Switzerland going to the theater, so I hope you'll forgive me for that. Uh, in any case, I, uh, uh, I'm very grateful uh, to Ted, Sarah, and Adam for taking charge of this important event. And I'm sure they will do an excellent job. I, I've been working with them for years and, and we share 
a great admiration for the Middle Eastern theater in general and for Nehad Saleha in particular. I'm sorry that we could not have had this event when the book appeared, uh, and we this is, of course, connected with our translation of the collection that first appeared in Cairo of Nehad's um, uh, critical writings, but that came during COVID and everything was disrupted, as you know. So this is belated, but nevertheless important uh, part of our activities, not only because it represents a continuing commitment of the Siegel Center uh, and its publication wing to the Middle Eastern theater, but also because of all the recent figures in the Middle Eastern theater, I can think of no one of more importance, influence, and admiration than Nehad Saleh. Uh, I first met her, oh, it must be 30, 40 years ago, uh, because I had had a number of, of Egyptian students. I was visiting them in Cairo. They all knew Nehad, and they all said, the one person in theater in Egypt that you must get to know is Nehad Saleh. I, I did meet with her on a number of occasions, I uh, always found them enormously illuminating. She was a wonderful person. She indeed knew everybody and was kind of the, the mother of the contemporary Egyptian theater. Um, she was something rather unusual in the Arab world, uh, and indeed, in the alas, in the Western world as well, and that is a very distinguished woman dramatic critic, um, the uh, the most distinguished, regardless of gender, in the Arab world, and I would say one of the most distinguished anywhere. Um, all of us who were interested in the Egyptian theater regularly read her articles that appealed in, uh, that appeared in El Aram and were available online. Um, just her contribution to an understanding of the Egyptian theater and particularly the Egyptian avant-garde and experimental theater, in which she had a particular interest, and indeed particularly in the theater of the new upcoming young dramatists in the Egyptian theater, especially women, uh, all of whom owed a great debt to her because she was sort of their voice and their encouragement. Um, uh, many studied directly with her or, or were influenced by her. Um, and in her later years, she also became an international voice for the Egyptian theater, indeed for the Arab theater in general. Uh, she became an active participant in the International Federation for Theater Research. Uh, since a number of people who were active in that organization were aware of her work and encouraged her to become connected with the organization. She became a very active member and indeed uh, at one point gave the keynote address. This was for the International Conference uh, uh, in Stockholm uh, and was indeed the first speaker from the Arab world to give uh, a plenary session address at the International Federation of Theater Research. Um, for many of us, she was the voice of not only the Egyptian, but the, but the Arab theater in general. Uh, her influence, of course, at home and abroad were great, uh, was great and is lasting because, of course, many of the people that she worked with, that she encouraged, that she discovered are now important figures in the Egyptian theater. Uh, 
just last year, or I guess the year before last, uh, one of the Cairo experimental theaters was rechristened the Nahad Saleha Theater. I was fortunate enough to visit it last year. Uh, it, it is a perfect monument to her uh, since it specializes in upcoming developing artists, new work. Uh, and not only is it symbolically and practically a wonderful memorial tour, but it is literally a memorial tour, not only bearing her name, but there are little display cases inside the lobby of the theater that have uh, some of her writings, uh, that have some of the many um, awards that were given to her. And as you go in the building and look at the walls inside, you see that they they have a kind of Renaissance European symbolism about them, clouds, um, mythological figures, and so on. Not uh, uh, not of specific identifiable figures, but all the figures are female, uh, and there's a kind of an exaltation of the 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 female creative spirit, which seems to me the 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 perfect image for Neha. Uh, it's wonderful that we have another occasion to once again mark her enormous contributions. Again, I apologize for not being there in the place, but I'm certainly with you in the spirit. Uh, and thank you for all attending participating, supporting, uh, and have a wonderful discussion today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. I, I'm delighted to be able to communicate. She's nothing if not persistent. <laughs> So um, we are going to do some readings and just talk about why we selected these readings and what they mean to us. But before we start with that, um, I thought it would be fun just to hear from you guys what she has meant in your kind of imaginations when you first encountered her writings. Um, so yeah, so Sarah, would you mind starting? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so I I came to Nahed's work pretty much through being a very frustrated, disgruntled graduate student. Uh, I was studying at the University of Colorado Boulder. I was trying to figure out for the life of me, where are the Middle Eastern women playwrights, uh, specifically in Egypt, looking at women playwrights in Egypt and directors and a legacy of theater. And so I came across Nahed Saleha's work. Uh, and one of the first essays I read by her was Women Playwrights in Egypt, which was absolutely incredible because not only did she, did I realize that she talks about the history of, and the breadth and depth of such incredible lineages and histories, uh, but she also talks about each of these individual playwrights and directors with, with such beautiful language. Uh, that it's as if that you're sitting in the room there with them. And so for someone who was so far away and like from a very different time period, it was just so incredible to be able to be exposed to such reading. So that was one of my first exposures with her. Uh, and then the more that I've read of her work, the more that I realize not only is she an instrumental theater critic for the region, both for Egypt, for North Africa, and then for the Arab world, but also as a universal theater critic. Uh, and so I continue reading her work and it's just, it's been so incredible seeing just how much she's genuinely been able to document and continue to have such a, an incredible pulse on the region and on the work that's being produced. Thank you for that. It's really exciting to hear. What, what a wonderful starting question. I So I, I first uh, encountered uh, Nahad's writing actually when I was in your class, Ted. I was a sophomore in NYU Abu Dhabi and I was studying theater. And I recall just feeling like I didn't, I wasn't finding a lot of Arab plays. And so I enrolled in theater in the Arab world, which Ted was teaching at the time. And that was how we first met. 
And I remember being um, quite struck by just the breadth of um, writing critical write plays, but also critical writing um, about the Arab world, which frankly, just generally as someone studying theater, even like in the Arab world, I did not know. And that was like a bias that I, as an 18 year old who had been born and raised in the Arab world was shocked to find like a syllabus is worth of, full of, of plays. Um, but I remember thinking also a lot of this writing is by men. And, and I was given what the subjects that I would come to write about later as a playwright, I was asking the question of, um, of are, is there a lot of writing on censorships in the Arab world and theater specifically? And so I just literally searched in like the library database <laughs> uh, censorship, Arab world, drama, theater. And this essay called uh, the, 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 fi the Fire and the Frying the Pan. The Fire and the Frying Pan, yes. And the, and I, I remember thinking, wow, what an odd name for an essay. And, and then that was the first name I, I, the first time I encountered the head's name and I started reading it. And the the criticism and the, the theoretical frameworks she was engaging with so rigorously and yet so excessively to me as a, as a second year undergraduate was were um stunning but more than that it was the autoethnography element it was how much she she in her own right was a dramatist and how she framed each paragraph and how she dramatized how she was coming to each thought through her lived experience um being a critic in Cairo and I was like, who is this person? I need to read everything she and so I uh, she's ever written. And so I, which I have not because there is so much and she's so brilliant. Um, but I um, kind of went on a deep dive and that was the beginning. I mean, that actually speaks to something I was gonna comment on, which is that, um, you know, I knew, I knew about her before I had read anything about her because she's one of those figures who has such, pro you know, there are people who have such prominence that you feel you know all about them, even though you haven't read them yet. It's just because their name keeps coming up. And the, the, the statement that kept coming up about this woman is that she says things that other people can't say. <laughs> um, and it really is the case that she um, was able to, because of the, well, first of all, the breadth of knowledge was just astounding. Her, her, her knowledge of the range of work that was being done throughout the Middle East, but more specifically, how it engaged, contested, responded to other theater traditions, not just the Western theater traditions, but prominent among that, the Western theater traditions, that there was a kind of expertise that uh, gave her a prominence and a prominence that allowed her to voice, voice criticisms that many other people would, would feel frightened to make. And I, I, the one thing I heard her say, I, I, there was a, con I was part of a conversation. I was, I had the opportunity, I heard her ch chatting and someone asked her if she had ever been censored, if anyone had ever said, you can't write that. And she said, no, I've been remarkably Success, I've been remarkably fortunate in being able to write what I think. And then she stopped her and said, there was one occasion, she goes, the Saudis had funded the Cairo Federation, the, um, the Cairo Festival of, of Experimental Theater. And when I was reviewing that work, there was a Saudi piece. And the first line of my review was, if the Saudis want to do something experimental, they should try putting a woman on the stage. <laughs> And apparently she was not allowed to start the article. And that was, of course, because the Saudis were paying the bill, right? That, that there was a certain point at which there was a lot. But 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 I'm, I'm, we're going to read from some of her stuff and you'll see she, she holds no punches. And what's so striking is that I had this image of who she was. Finally, I got around to reading her stuff, blown away by its intelligence. And then I got the chance to meet her in different venues. Such a charming, soft-spoken, uh, I mean, just make space for everybody in the room. Um, so, you know, the woman, really, really the woman contained multitudes. It was pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, so she yeah. was really quite a power. There's also a, like, across all of, and I, this is, 
I think this will demonstrate itself in the excerpt. I would love to read eventually, but um, there's a, a level of vulnerability to how she writes and a, a fusing of the personal in her writing. Um, I mean, that censorship essay is so compelling because it's such a an interesting mirror of content and form because in the way she writes it, it uh, it is so specific and so personal that she's seldom making very grand statements about like, this is what the authorities do. She's talking about like anecdotes of things that she has encountered and dealt with. And through that, and it becomes through the personal and the vulnerable, it's, and also a lot of um, things that often almost seem like entendres that I, uh, makes it very difficult to censor. I think you have to be very smart to understand what she's, or not even very smart. You have to be moderately smart to understand what she's saying. Okay, yeah. I think with that though, and before we start reading, I kind of invite all of you to kind of think of a really delicious meal that you've eaten recently. Think of that, think of where it sits in your like tummy and in your mind and in your feelings. And that is what this kind of writing is. And it's just, it's so beautiful. It's kind of like you sit there in like this delightful little moment of emotions and everything. And she takes you on these beautiful journeys. It's almost as if you're not reading academic writing at all. So with that impetus, I'd love for us to start actually reading this. And, and would you start first? Sure. Um, okay, so I've got two excerpts I'd like to read. Uh, the And they're coming from... Volume two, so this is Plays and Playwrights. Uh, and in this, so she talks about all of these, she's got an essay or she's got multiple essays in this. And then she, uh, in this volume, like there's a lot of different excerpts about specific playwrights and their own plays. And so I'm gonna read uh, an, an excerpt of the first essay that actually stood out to me, the very first one that I read of hers, which is called Women Playwrights in Egypt. The list of women playwrights in Egypt is depressingly short. When you have counted everybody, including the one-timers and those who have never made it to the stage, and even if you add for bonus Amina El Sawi, who adapted some novels in the 60s, the number does not exceed a dozen. Compared to other Arab countries, however, Egypt does not seem to have done too badly in the space of 40 years. Besides, if we were to expand the theme and make it women dramatists in Egypt, we will find that at least six women have tried their hand at television drama. My business here, however, is with women who specifically wrote with the stage in mind. So that is just a short little preface. Uh, and then I'd like to take you to one of the first accounts of a woman playwright who she does mention in this uh, book, Fathaya El Asad. This called Ducks and Drakes, Women's Prison. Nowadays, few playwrights adhere to the concept of theatre as a public forum. But Hayal Asal, however, perhaps because she's a woman living in a third world country, or by dint of her political loyalties as an active member of the Egyptian left since the 60s, still persists in this belief. With her, the political message holds unqualified supremacy and is usually projected with ferocious clarity and blinding conviction. Artistic considerations come second. And although careful to entertain that she preaches and, and to sugarcoat the bitter pill, el would ruthlessly sacrifice them if they threatened to blur or muddle the issue at hand. All her plays, and they number five, seem to require an indeed Im implicitly call for a specific venue. They would show to best advantage if presented as theatre come discussion events within the precincts of El Tamago, the coalition or alliance party where she had belonged for years. It's a pity that her latest play, Women's Prison, which developed as the national last Thursday, missed the Population and Development Conference. It would have served to effectively underline in a popular medium like theater, many of her basic issues raised by the Egyptian Civic Forum and other non-governmental organizations. A feminist, El Asal certainly is, but her brand of feminism remains a subsidiary element in a wider political vision. Far from subscribing to the all men are bastards school of feminism, 
she champions the cause of the oppressed, male or female, while maintaining that all of the oppressed of the world, women have the roughest deal. In her private conversations, she never fails to acknowledge the debt she owes to her husband, novelist Abdullah al tuhi and to all the men who helped her along the way. She has no quarrel with men. She consistently re reiterates the arch villain is the totalitarian system, alternatively dubbed by her as the rule of the military. The female oppression is a direct result of political male oppression, is an article of faith with her. This affectionate, motherly attitude towards men underlies all of her writing for theatre, radio, or television, providing a soft padding to cushion many of her candid revelations, which explains her popularity with both men and women. Like many critics, I have always found the task of evaluating Lassa's writing in purely aesthetic terms completely unmanageable. The connecting points between the earthly female and the political activist, between the passionate feminist and the creative artist, keep shifting. Her writing is an organic extension of her genuinely feminine experience, and it continuously reshapes and expands it. Her confessional style, muddied, down-to-earth diction, dauntless embracing of sensationalism and declamation, coupled with seemingly random and episodic structure of her, of her plays, would put the wind up any critic. He or she would feel unbearably prodded and baited to rant, either against her or in her favour. There is no middle of the way response. In women's prison, Elasa resorts to the same dramatic formula she effectively used before her Women Without Masks, performed at El Salem Theatre nearly 12 years ago. Plot and linear development are ditched in favour of the theme and variation pattern where we get a succession of confessional monologues, each representing the tragic life history in miniature. The narrator, in most cases, belongs to a downtrodden silent majority. Those women whose verbal output, though vo voluminous, never gets to the printed records of history. Indeed, the recent rowdy controversy over the CNN's film, which featured the savage butchery of a young female in the name of circumcision, would not have happened had people read or seen El Asal's older play, where one of the four female characters' central monologues focus on this harrowing experience and its psychologically disastrous after effects. Asal's choice of social context, the lower rungs of the economic ladder, and her passionate delight in eavesdropping on the chit chat of her females align with the Egyptian literary oral tradition. In this tradition, Tawfiq al Hakim found his first inspirational fount, which eventually carried him to the rarefied atmosphere of the academies of France. And it's precisely the same tradition that Hassan al Gretli al Warsha's tiled and cultivated for their tides of night. El Asal stumbled upon instinctively a self-taught, self-made intellectual who personally fought against great odds. She believed that the most important events in a woman's life are verbal. Women may not be able to change history, but at least they can bear witness to it. Hence the choral structure and commentary aptitude of her plays. if I should stop or keep going for time. Um, I'm, I'm not worried about time. I'm, okay. Is there, yeah. As in Arabian Nights, in women's prison, a central con consciousness relays to us the adventures of the characters. But unlike Shahrazad, uh, El Asal Salwa, a journalist and writer like herself, undergoes a transformation. She and her friend Layla provided not only a thread on which all monologues of the prisoners are strung, but also a self-critical focus on the events. A staunch leftist, Lassal has given in this, her most recent play, the most invalidating criticism anyone has dared throw at the Egyptian left. In a confrontation scene between her theatrical persona, Salwa, the journalist, a young university graduate, Lassal candidly admits the failure of the Egyptian leftist project. The wonderful and electric Wafa Sadiq asks Al Asal's persona, Magda Al Khatib, why, if you have been fighting for the oppressed, are there still such people as the inhabitants of this prison? 
which bespells Egypt. Elisa's answer, bodied forth in her characters, particularly Layla and Selwa, is that she could not but acknowledge, like most of a generation, the moral dichotomy and ideological split personality of the educated Egyptian middle class. Throughout the play, politically innocent and naive Layla, who gets accidentally embroiled in politics, though she had resigned herself a life of uh, marital slavery after her fa father's death, opting for a patriarchal substitute in the unconscionable businessman, desperately fights the truth. Looking like a travesty of a woman, a painted doll with heavy makeup and a blonde wig in a revealing evening dress that barely hides the many bruises caused by her husband's wife battering sprees. She stuns us at the end with a veritable coupe de théâtre, de théâtre when the chips are down all, and all is lost. She tears off her wig to display a wonderful mop of black hair, a dramatic way of demonstrating the refusal to be untrue to herself any longer. I think we'll pause right there. Yeah. I just want to, you know, before we go on to Adam, I just want to point out, you know, on the surface of it, you're hearing dramatic criticism. It seems primarily concerned with a thematic analysis, but it's almost like by subterfuge that she frames it as a commentary on the challenges that women playwrights face. Almost as an aside, she comments on how there are current injustices that are happening that you know wouldn't be happening if people were more familiar with this play, such that when she then segues into talking about you know imprisonment, she doesn't have to make the connection. Yeah. It's already there in the air. Yeah. So you're making the connection with contemporary events with the what's happening in the play. Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 really kind of it's so clever how she takes what appears to be just straight thematic analysis and makes it about the productions of theater making, the institutional barriers women face, and the political injustices that exist currently. Yeah. It's there's the the extent to which she's a, a sociologist. I think I I learned as someone who like I have not found a lot of historical texts about or contemporary or modern texts about the state of theater making or artistic economies in in Egypt in her her criticisms in, in themselves provide like to paint the picture of what the landscape is and and more importantly I feel um they really in their in their framing of of the plays serve as a social critiques of themselves yeah it's almost like it's theatre history and political commentary both at once. And it's done so brilliantly that you're almost sitting there watching the play that she's talking about and you're understanding the socio-political atmosphere that they're writing this play in. And I think there's this under I, in, I think of criticism, criticism of criticism. I think of um, in our contemporary moment in the United States and New York, I uh, again, I'm a new playwright. And so I, I, I hear a lot of conversations about um, the positionality of the critic and the critic um, having to assume neutrality and, and that being almost the appropriate stance to critique from. And I'm, I'm really struck by the extent to which um, her her politics and her stances and her ideology um there's the writing is really a conversation between her, her who she is and the text and the performance in a way that um does not claim neutrality and and actually really takes acknowledges her positionality in relation to what she's saying adam what do you want to read for us We have a theme here, um, which is the class I took with Ted however many years ago, <laughs> uh, because I also first read this play, Drunken Days, by Sadala Wanous, and learned about this playwright who has since, in many ways, really shaped my artistic um, vision of the world um, in this class. 
And Drunken Days was a play I read in that class, and I I did not have the privilege of encountering this review of it, of this production in Cairo uh, until a few days ago, actually. But I, I'm i really struck by what she does in this review, and so I'm going to, I think I'm going to read, it's five pages, maybe I'm going to read the entirety of it, maybe I won't, we'll find out. Um, but yeah, the... The review is from December 1999. It's the that uh, it's called the that time of year, and the play is Drunken Days by Sada Lowen Noose. I was not in the brightest frame of mind when I made my way to the book fair last week to take part in two symposia: one on the future of the Egyptian theater, and the other on the position of women in the contemporary world viewed from a feminist angle. The trip across town at the height of rush hour, 2 p.m., in a rickety, grunting taxi amidst all the noise and fumes seemed a cruel conspiracy against my already very jagged nerves. For weeks, I had been battling against a tidal wave of depression and spiritual fatigue brought on by a series of internal landslides. My daughter moving out to set up home elsewhere proved a traumatic experience. I had not realized how our lives had become intermeshed and how much I depended on her as a friend and companion. For years, we've gathered around town in her little car, ferreting out exciting out-of-the-way shows or sitting through dreary and dull ones that rambled on for over four hours. Her witty remarks and funny comments helped me through many a miserable performance and afterwards our little cafe and lively exchanges of views and impressions a profound dialogue between sensibilities and generations. Theater is a collective experience, both in the making and consumption. And I have always found that sharing a performance with a kindred mind makes one's reception sharper, more sensitive and perceptive, perhaps fairer as well. The second landslide happened soon after. On the last day of Ramadan, Ali Ra'i, the critic who re revolutionized theater criticism in the 60s, Oh, no. Oh, this is right. In the 60s, shifting the focus from the literary text to performances and performers, and reshaped the artistic sensibility and approach to theater of generations and artists, died. Oddly, the following day, I heard the Polish director Jerzy Grotowski, another man whose theories have had a seminal influence in the Egyptian theater since the late 80s, and who also foregrounded the performer, had decided, as if by assignation, to join al Rai on his voyage to explore what one French writer called the Grand Peturtre. It felt like the end of an era. In one sense, the history of the Egyptian theater from the 60s onwards can be read as a dialectical movement between the ideas of the two men. In his improvisational comedy and other books, al Rai put forward the concept of a popular theater which gives room for the actors to exercise their creativity and power of invention and engages the masses in an active participatory experience closely linked with their daily reality. The translation of Grotowski's book towards a poor theater, on the other hand, swung the pendulum in the opposite direction in favor of an exclusive kind of theatrical experience based on long and arduous spiritual and physical training on part of the actors and involving a small audience prepared to take psychological risks to cross our frontier and exceed our limitations, as Grotowski puts it. A theater where the actor is a high priest who creates the dramatic liturgy and at the same time guides the audience into the experience. I'm going to skip a paragraph where she talks about towards a poor theater because I'm sure some of you know it. And if you don't, she's given you a little bit of it. <laughs> um, I had hardly recovered from my sorrow over Al Ra'i's death when I heard the death first of Fathi Ghanim, then at close heels of Lutfi Al Khuli. Ghanim's dramatic novel, um, Fathi Ghanim, and then at close heel of Lutfi Al Khuli. Ghanim's dramatic novel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, where the story is narrated from different points of view, had convinced me in the 60s of the relativity of truth and partial, partial fictionality of all accounts of it. For me and my generation, it was a revelation and has left an indelible impression on the imagination. Al Khuli, though mainly a particular, mainly a particular thinker, a political thinker and writer, had played an active part in the theater of the 60s. And I remember bumping into him often at Al Hakim Theater in Ahmed, Ahmed Street. 
At the same time, we were putting on a student show of Shakespeare's plays. In these days, theater were, was regarded as an effective political forum and taken very seriously. Al Khuli wrote three plays for it King's Cafe, or Ahwat al Muluk, The Lawsuit, Al Qadiya, and The Rabbits, Al Arenab. All were comedies in the tradition of socialist realism, projecting ordinary scenes and characters from daily life in an exaggerated, sometimes farcical manner, and using them as a vehicle for the writer's progressive socialist ideas. I remember Dilkhuli and his rabbits during the symposium on women's position at the book fair. It turned out that despite all the profound insights put across by the panel of speakers and all the serious issues they raised, what preoccupied the majority of the audience was the veil. Secondarily was the right of women to work. And one, one of the speakers, the, Jor, the Jordanian poetess, Zuleikha Aburisha, dared question the interpretation of a, politic, of a popular Islamic preacher of a verse of the Quran. She was nearly physically attacked and the meeting broke up in a near riot. I flew out feeling that my world lay around me in ruins, like Shakespeare's bare ruined choirs where late the sun the sweet birds sang. The sweet birds have been departing one after the other after the other, and those who remain are becoming a sad minority. That night though, I braved the cold and took a cab to Salem Theater. There a bunch of wonderful actors were playing Sadallah and Nusa's swan song, Drunken Days, or Ayyam al Mahmura, orchestrated by director Murad Munir. The vivid theatricality, poetic power and dauntless audacity of the text seem all the more stunning in view of the fact that one noose wrote it in the final stages of his battle with cancer, particularly on his deathbed, practically on his deathbed. Like the rights of signs and changes written three years earlier in 1994, it is a staunchly feminist play, which ruthlessly exposes the repression of women in the Arab world and their mental and physical abuse in patriarchal societies. The heroine, Sana, is married off, or rather bartered by her family at the age of 15 to a rich mer merchant who nightly rapes her at a gruesome ritual. At 37, with four grown sons and daughters, she falls passionately in love with a Christian widower and after an agonizing conflict, elopes with him. Her decision is not prompted by love alone, but also by overpowering desire to act of her own free will at last once in her life, as she tells her youngest daughter. The different attitudes and reactions of her family to the scandal and the individual fates of its members build up a panoramic image of a sick society, deeply riddled with moral, political, and ideological contradictions. I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, equally intriguing as its subject is the play's structure. The story is given to us through a narrator, Sanet's grandson, who in a series of interviews with the surviving members of the family tries to ferret out its details and piece them together. The interviews, which happened in the past, are enacted before us in the present, and the memories they yield are often likewise enacted. Other scenes, particularly those representing Sanet's relationship with her lover, are described by the narrator in a chorus of clowns as imaginative efforts to fill in the gaps in the narrative. The distance created by this technique between the story and the audience allows a space for reflection, which is what Wanus, deeply influenced by Brecht, always wanted in his theater, and saves the play from the pitfalls of sensationalism and melodrama. In, Muna, uh, in Murad Munir's production, first presented in Al Hanegir last year, when transfer, then transferred to Il Salem with new sets and minor changes in the cast, both the, lyr the lyricism and theatricality of the texts were highlighted. A large dose of music, drawn mostly from old songs and popular tunes, played live on the lute and piano by the, narr by the narrator. Way Il Semi was added. It contributed to the smooth, the smooth transition from scene to scene setting the emotional tone for each and efficiently filling up the time required by many set changes. I would have preferred a less cluttered stage, fewer painted drops and props, a more studied choice of costume and a less exuberant choreography. But there were plenty of good and sensitive acting in really demanding parts and not just from the leading actors, Sumayel Alfi, Khaled Usawi and Ateya Oase but also from a promising crop of young performers, some of whom are making their stage debuts in this production. 
There was also the text, shocking and liberating and practically uncut. A credit to our censor and the best antidote to depression. She's so good. <laughs> I mean, what's so striking is how she contrasts the dilemma of her child leaving, yeah, which sets off the depression for this piece about a woman who was sold into a marriage, right? Um, and um, a marriage to a bath, you know, a, a Bathist regime officer. I'm sorry, and now I'm thinking of a Islam Shakia, um, but um, you know, <clears throat> and her and her struggle then to like leave that space and yeah. make her own life, yeah, which is kind of like her recognition that she can't keep her own child at home. Yeah. There's also like a couple of paragraphs in there that like she so seamlessly inter it's it is theater history, as you said earlier. She interweaves um those two seminal figures in of Egyptian theater and, and theater history. Um and also to position the death of Grotowski with a local critic. Um and like there there's a political act in putting those two like uh, venerations and like eulogies of sorts in the same paragraph um, and I find that to be really exciting and how she theorizes Egyptian theater very casually mm -hmm. theorizes Egyptian theater as a fusion of those two figures um, yeah just so so brilliant I love that she models the binaries of private and public of uh, academic and then of personal of Egypt versus like you know European forms of theater and it's just so so seamless it's just she goes in and out of these like polar opposite like worlds yeah it 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 almost feels like this sounds like it almost feels like she's it's a diary entry like it feels yes. not wrought yes. even though I know it takes a lot of like it actually it's very natural it feels so organic even yeah. though I'm sure it takes like so much finesse for her to actually do that so yeah. to, in a way that feels so seamless and yeah. that's the beauty of it because you yeah. feel like you just listen to a story yeah so I'm gonna read uh, I'm gonna kind of drop in and out of two different um reviews uh, both of them also by reviews of productions by Sadala Wanos, the Syrian playwright. And uh, what interests me is um, how she just kind of surreptitiously introduces information about the theater industry, about censorship, about what it's like to be a woman in Egypt, all, you know, in the, under the guise of just writing a theater review, you know, so... Uh, so this is Time Out of Joint, the premiere of Sadala Wannos' A Day of Our Times at al Grad Hall. So when I heard that the director, Anne Darwara, was rehearsing Sadala Wannos' A Day of Our Times at al Grad Theater, I was thrilled that last lovers of Wannos' work were going to see this ferocious, deliciously outrageous satire on the mores and morals of our times in a live performance. It was too good to be true. When Wannis wrote the play in 1993, breaking a dramatic silence which lasted 13 years, he couldn't get it published anywhere in Syria. And though it appeared a year later in the Egyptian literary period periodical Adeb wa Maqad, Literature and Criticism, and the Lebanese Al Adab, The Arts, magazine in 1994 before it was printed in 1996 in his collected works, there have been only two productions of it so far. If I remember correctly, both performed in relatively censorship-free events, one by a Jordanian troupe performed by, at the Cairo International um, for, uh, Experimental Theater Festival, and another by a fringe group from Bahrain at the Amman Free Theater Festival some years ago. Apart from these, I know of no professional Arab director who dared to touch it before Dawara embarked on his current production. So, you know, in that first paragraph, it... It sounds like she's just giving you a little bit of information on its publication history, except she's just kind of slipped in there that it couldn't be it couldn't be published, you know, and that it took this circuitous route to get performed. But then, you know, at that point, she's prepared to, like, put her cards on the table. This is not surprising in countries where freedom of expression is severely curtailed and public performance is heavily censored. A Day of Our Times is simply too verbally audacious, too shockingly outspoken. In five scenes, which take the form 
a violent confrontation punctuated by narrative passages and comments by the author in a voiceover, one knows traces the progress or rather plummeting of his hero from innocence to experience, from blissful ignorance to a terrible awakening and from hope to the depths of despair. And then, you know, this plot synopsis continues and, and it's a very concise and sharp plot synopsis but and then she goes into you know a, a kind of careful reading of the scenic design and how all these things support the production and it feels just like oh, okay now we're back in the world of dramatic criticism she's not you know she's she doesn't have an axe to grind and then she finishes talking about how great the acting is and then she says no amount of good acting or directing however can mend what the censor has hopelessly spoiled which is the text. At his orders, chunks were hacked. Whole scenes like Sheikh Mutwali's radio talk were completely rewritten and rephrased in a more polite idiom. In many words, particularly those that referred to organs or other parts of the body were replaced with euphemisms. It was as cruel as plucking out the teeth and fangs of a lion and removing its claws to consign it to the circus ring. The censoring process left us with a tame, docile text that had no bite. The heroes raging against the world and its sinful ways, however, was mostly left intact. He is, after all, a romantic idealist and does not use offensive words. <laughs> and so was the final repentance and suicide scene. Should one be grateful? For that and go along with the old Egyptian proverb, to be half blind is better that, than not to see at all. I, for one, do not feel particularly grateful. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, she, she's just throwing, she just like, you know, you just read an, an art, you know, a, a theater review, then suddenly there is a lot of shade getting thrown <laughs> at the Egyptian government and censorship. Yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to read this from, um, her uh, review of um, Wretched Dreams, Ahlam Shakia, Riding a Rough Wave, the premiere of Sadala Wanus's Ahlam Shakia at Al Hanagar. So here as well, I'm going to be kind of selective about what I read, but um, two oppressed women, both unhappily married, share an old humble house in a small Syrian town. The temporal backdrop is the early 60s during which the political winch hut for socialists and Nasserists, which followed the breakdown of the Syrian-Egyptian political merger. The first woman, Mary, the owner of the house, is an ailing, middle-aged, pious, Orthodox Christian married to a selfish, wily, strutting dud, an inveterate sponger who has infected her with gonorrhea on their wedding night. Sexually ignorant, like most Arab middle-class females of conservative families, and shy of broaching sexual matters with anybody, it takes her years and a traumatic miscarriage in the sixth month of her pregnancy to discover the cause of the burning pain in her bowels, the incessant foul-smelling discharges that constantly soil her underwear, making her loathe her body and her fast deteriorating health. Just talking about a play. Right, right. This isn't an indictment of you know the patriarchal order in Egypt. I'm just, I'm just writing about a play. Um, what a way to drop us into that production, right? What a way to drop us into that production. I mean, it continues like that. Um, I'm going to just jump ahead to another paragraph that I find really compelling. These are the two women whose portrait Sadella Wanus has drawn in clear, unwavering lines with passionate care and stunning empathy in Ahlam Shakia. By the way, we only now, after like three pages, are introduced to the place title. Hmm. And by withholding the place title until that moment, we can't help but think that she's writing about Egyptian society, right? I mean, she's saying it's a play, I'm not talking about your country. I'm not talking about your father. I'm not talking about, you know, the people who live next door. I'm just writing about a play, except she doesn't tell us what the play is, right? Until she's like halfway into the review. 
These are the two women whose portraits Sadella Windows has drawn in clear, unwavering lines with passionate care and stunning empathy and Ahlam Shakir anguished dreams in 1994, three years before he died. Like all the heroines of the plays in the final phase of his career, they go beyond protest to put Arab society and the whole of its culture on trial, questioning with ruthless, uncompromising honesty its most hallowed precepts and basic assumptions including its attitudes to women, love, sex, marriage, and even homosexuality, incest, and conjugal fidelity, and trace the insidious invisible link between political, social, sexual, and religious oppression. Okay, I mean, right there, right? This is not a play about an oppressive family. This is a play about oppressive regimes, right? I mean, which is true. I mean, that's entirely what the piece is about, but um, she just... I, I haven't encountered other reviews, Arab reviews, that just say it explicitly. That you know, they just say the violence done against this woman is the violence of the Ba'ath regime against the Syrian people. I mean, that's the the underlying premise of this of this uh, in, in, um, review. Here, as in rites of signs and changes, or in drunken days, the sexual is defined an irrefutably political. Chasm's job as a policeman whose sole duty is to hound political dissenters and Ferris's jubilation at the prospect of becoming a secret political informer and, and Chasm's watchdog, not to mention the brutal battering of Rada undergoes when she voices different political sympathies and the whipping she undergoes when she asks for divorce. All these details strongly identify sexual and political oppression, designating both as varieties of moral corruption. The root cause in both is the same. It's a long review. I'm just trying to think if there's anything. I, I, I don't really think there's anything that tops that. Oh, let me just give you the last paragraph. It only remains to say that an uncensored Aslam Shakia would have been impossible without Huda Wasfi's courage and determination. It is a credit to her that she was able to convince the censor to let it pass in honor of Windows. It is also a credit to Makhor Thabit, the public censor, that he listened to her. The rewards were immense, and one hopes that this enlightened policy will continue. Alam Shakia has proved that with enough courage, faith, and conviction, one can ride even the roughest of waves. And here she's, you know, she's alluding to something, a, a phenomenon that was evident not only in Egypt, but of course, very much so in Syria, which is that in the final years of his life, when he was being, he was on the short list at Sadella Winus, in the final years of Sadella Winus's life, when it was clear he was going to die of cancer, and he was being shortlisted for a Nobel Prize, and he'd been asked to deliver the, the International Theater Day speech, there was a lot of like, how is it that the entire world is celebrating this man and we can't produce his plays. And in that one year, there was more productions of his work. Well, in the last year of his life, there were more productions of his work than there had been in you know, the five years prior. Um, and you know, she she's alluding to that fact and she kind of like trying to set the ground for its continuation. Which, and she also, I mean, she starts that, maybe it was the first review you read, but she starts with the, um, there's almost a, an acknowledgement that, because he wrote again in the last four years, from 93 to 97, in the last four years of his life, um, but he had not written for those 13 years, and she, there's almost an, an interrogation of, of why that is, um, which is obviously connected to this, yeah. So before I turn it to, to ask if you guys have any questions or observations, I just want to say, did anything, just ask, did anything kind of come up as we, as you heard all three? You know, just, I'm conscious that a lot of these have been, I mean, they're really, a lot of these were written in originally in Arabic and I'm, um, the translation work, because I, I don't know who did these translations, but I'm, I'm very in, in awe of um, how they, I, I've, I have had the chance, I've, had to look very hard to find her writing in Arabic, but um, it captures her tone. The translations do a really good job of capturing her sass and in a way that's um, 
really beautiful. And so shout out to whoever translated most of these. Um, but also just I'm the fact that her her bite does translate is um because I think it's a lot of it is not it's not quite um play on words or it's it's a uh, it's much more cerebral, which I find really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I said at the beginning of like, it feels, it genuinely does not feel like it's any kind of rigorous writing and it's so accessible and there's so much that she's touching on and it's almost like you can tell it's a very clear voice in each of these different pieces, regardless of like who she's writing about or what time period, she had a very, very long career and it does it almost doesn't matter what it is, but you can tell, you can kind of trace her own legacy and like her own growth as a theater critic and as a scholar and as an, an educator but then also you can trace the legacy of theater in Egypt like through the different ways in which she's talking about all these different plays which is so incredible and I love I think something that I really admire is the way that she'll not only write about one playwright at a time but she'll connect one play with someone else's play with a completely with the theater moment and then the legacies that came before it. And so there's all of this interweaving of painting this incredible picture of what's going on. So um, what does that bring up for you guys? What comes to mind uh, or what questions you have about Egyptian theater or her, her work in particular? And I'll hand the mic so that, oh, we've got a mic. If you'll indulge me for a moment, because it's not a question, and as being a moderator, it sometimes I always say, but that's not a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. I saw it on the invite, and I said, ooh, that's something I'm really interested in. A little bit about my background and the context of why I care so much about the subject. I'm a, I'm a producer. I'm primarily a producer of Arab, Asian, Middle Eastern, African works. So very interested in that region. I'm the producer of New York Arab Festival, which Adam has been in as part of our team. And my curator, Adham Hafez, when I told him I was going to this event, he said, it's not for Nehad, is it? And I said, yeah, actually. He said, oh my God, she's, she's the reason I am who I am. And he's a director, choreographer, curator um, from Cairo, but throughout the Arab world and the curator of New York Arab Festival, really radical, really progressive, really aggressive in the way he works. And he said that she said, never censor yourself. It's so important to, as you grow up into this world and as you show our theater, you, you take it here, you take it around, never censor yourself and always be true. And not knowing anything about her than hearing this, it's so interesting how she clearly doesn't censor herself and that, is, you know, especially for a, a person from a different region or a person of color or a person who's a woman or whatever separates you when you're used to being oppressed. It's interesting if you can be that example for others, it gives a lot of freedom. And that's something that it's clear she does. But the other thing I wanted to just make a little observation of is as a journalist, I'm gobsmacked because it's the type of work that, I like to do, but I feel is not really welcome here anymore. So it's personal, yet it's universal. It's long form. It's not quippy and short and like, hated it, loved it kind of nonsense. It's very deeply thought out. It takes you on a journey. It takes you on a story. And it does cover so many landscapes of the theater, of the place, of the people, of the time, of the era that you can take that and feel like it's a time capsule for exactly what's going on at that moment. So I feel like just from what you read, I really understand Egypt at this time and, and, and the Arab world at this time, just from that little sampling. So she's really giving this enormous gift um, to generations to continue with that. And that's, that's remarkable that she's done that and that it exists, but she also speaks to what I think is the magic balance that a journalist should strive to reach. Let me put it this way, not a journalist, an art critic, because it's very specific. Two things. She 
focuses on the audience where if you were very knowledgeable in the topic, like a lot of us might be, you would get it and not feel like you were spoken down to. But if you knew nothing about it, you wouldn't feel like it's an academic conversation. You have to have a PhD to understand. And secondly, because she's not a journalist, she's not neutral. She's an arts journalist, which means she loves the theater and you feel it in there. So even the criticisms of the set, the costumes didn't really do the right thing. Most of it's positive support for the art form itself with some, here's some room for improvement. And that's what I appreciate. Thank you. Oh, that's a, that's a lovely contribution. We have time for one more. Yeah. Uh, other observations? So um, what is her legacy in Egypt currently? Because I was there in November and um, I was actually staying with a filmmaker who'd ever seen a film called The Square. So I was staying with her and the take I got was whatever that happened in Egypt is actually reversed and gone in, in a worse direction. Yeah. I mean, it's like a peaceful dictatorship sort of. I mean, I don't know about peaceful, but uh, um, everyone's afraid to do anything at all. Um, <laughs> so therefore, there's peace because no one's I mean, doing a thing. Yeah, in that sense, sure. Um, but um, yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, um, I think the question of legacy is a a really striking and challenging one. And I, um, I mean, we we were having this conversation. Sarah and I were like texting a few weeks ago, and she was like what plays do you know besides the one anthology that is about like the revolution and Tahrir, what plays do we know from Egypt that are like publicly accessible or have had a life in the last like 10 from the last 10, 15 years and um, not revivals. And there are productions of Shakespeare and Greek plays and revivals of really beautiful um, 20th century Egyptian plays, uh, but new work and, um, and we did neither of us could really come up with a list more than three three plays and um and it's not because they don't exist i'm sure, like in a population of 100 million people i'm sure they exist um but there's either a question of um is there a person like nahat suleha who's are there institutions because she also comes from a very specific place she has an origin story of like having wanted to be an actor but tradition um, interrupted that and her her husband her partner was also um, what went to England uh, on a fellowship for arts and humanities studies and she studied she got her MA in English literature there and so um, there there's like you know there's a specific DNA of things that made this person this person and um, and I do I, I, I don't know that I can think of uh, a, a contemporary equivalent uh if there is i i would yeah i so i think the question about a legacy is kind of twofold i don't know that there is a contemporary equivalent but also maybe there can't be you know like That's, she also... i mean more like what is the theater scene in because when i was with my friend who's a filmmaker there she's like culturally everything's flat well, I think that's the like I think like the re the theaters she references uh, like uh, Salem or Hanegir, like they are doing um play like yeah the they're not things I would go see and I think but I I have been told they're um like I think decaf the festival mm -hmm. there are a couple of things that are either by nature durational and short term because that's harder to censor or they're underground and we as people who live in the U.S. don't hear about them. And I think uh, th this is kind of getting to the root of the problem and kind of the brilliance of what her work really is, is that she's writing at a moment of change in Egypt, both socially, politically, economically, religiously. She's writing, she's kind of in between that, like Nasser said that time period, Mubarak, like she's, you know, seen it all. And something that's really incredible is that she's she's talking from like a very scholarly lens and we don't really have much of that anymore. And so is theater happening? Yes, 100%. Are people still influenced by her legacy and like are doing the work that she, that she talks of? And, you know, she references the American University in Cairo several times in a write-in. She talks about the Experimental Theater Festival, which is still happening and has been revived in like 2014. She talks about a lot of these theater companies that are still happening today and they're still producing. But I think we get into a bigger conversation of what is being published what is not being published and then what is being available online and i think that is part of kind of our own frustration and and limited access to the work 
the work's definitely happening. Her legacy is alive and and well. Like people will always be inspired by the work that she's doing. Like she's, you know, you can't erase her out of the memory of theater. Um, I'm thinking more like, but the whole point of a critic is to help better the actual art form. Yeah. yeah. Has the art form improved? Yeah. Or has it culturally? But, but I, I think that's yeah. where maybe you and I are. I'm not sure. I don't know that the work is happening. Like in the same way that there is. Uh, maybe the, I'm too close. Um, in the <laughs> um, in the same way that uh, that that there's maybe a precarity or a, a loss of like um, criticism as a field as a result of censorship and as a result of like um, increasing. I mean, there's always obviously there was always censorship and there's censorship everywhere. Um, but um, just the extent of it, there's. I, I wonder if like resources uh, and for the, the development of new work has have also really been influenced. When also of skill of reporters, like she's got a PhD, and that's a you know she's a highly intellectual, highly traveled woman, and so how many, how many theater journal or how many reviewers do you have or art critics who have a PhD? who are able to do that kind of work, who are currently living and working in Egypt and not the diaspora is. Uh, uh, where, where would you find this like, uh, 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 current? Uh, you know, I mean, there are, there are venues that are doing experimental work, but the problem is that, our, and I, I'm, you, I'll, I'll defer to you on this, but my sense is that a lot of these venues are doing like Masra Basri, like visual theater, mm -hmm. or Masra Harakat, you know, yeah, movement yeah. theater. And it, you know, pre you, there's nothing to censor, mm -hmm. right? There's there's no overt political statement being made, yeah. but there's also limited opportunity for a dramaturg or a literary critic to engage it uh, yeah. the way she would. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about, oh, when were the moments where there were this outpouring of compelling writing? Well, in the aftermath of the 67 war, where yeah. that you couldn't, you couldn't, you yeah. You couldn't deny it. Yeah. Or right around the 2011 yeah. uprising. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, there there really are these moments where it becomes possible to articulate that which cannot be stated. And then there are these long troughs when where you're just doing, you know, yeah. You, you're doing really sometimes very interesting, you know, uh, um, takes on Don Quixote. <laughs> or you know, I mean, you're you're going to classic yeah. texts where you you, yeah. you can't be censored, or you're doing movement theater yeah. or these kind of visual spectacles. I mean, I, I not to self plug, but uh, um, when I think the last time we were in Cairo together, I was uh, the Cairo Experimental Theater Festival in 2018. Was it 18? It was 18. <laughs> and and like the best performance I saw that year was uh, Syrian directors translation adaptation of a John Genet play and it was very poignant but it was a John Genet play <laughs> because um and and also I um, mean we saw with Marvin uh the night traveler which was um which was beautiful and it was site specific it was in this like train carriage um at the opera house um but I I, I do think that's a question of also like where's playwriting training I don't know that there's playwriting training in Egypt really <laughs> um yeah I, I, I think we've gone way over, <laughs> which is, I, I guess that means that it went well. So, but, sure. Uh, th yes. Yeah, yes. I, we'll get the visit we'll the, the Seagal Center website for all five of these books in the volume. In the five volumes are all available for purchase <laughs> in the physical copy. Wait, you just gave me like the. What are the like home video seller? <laughs> QVC. It's very QVC. That was very. Please buy. <laughs> it was yeah, very. Put it on. <laughs> it's very. Um. Yeah. Yes, I I have thoughts actually. Yes. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you up there. Yeah. Thank you for moderating this. <laughs>